This guy's got. This guy's got all the energy for everybody. Eh? It's good. So we're gonna we're gonna try to stay on task here. We you know we're trying to get through the manual now. There there has never been a time I don't think. Well, sometimes for us, but for 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 Curry most of the time we never get through a manual because oftentimes there's people that need to hear one specific thing. And if there is, you know, however many people are sitting in here, if there's one person that needs what people would call a rabbit trail, which it really isn't, um, they need to hear that one thing. God will direct that thing for that one person in a group of 10,000 people to get to that one person. Why? Because he loves that. I mean, the whole thing is to leave the 99 for the one and all that kind of stuff. He'll do that. So some people might think, oh, like, where's this all going? But the one person's like, this is hitting me hard. And so that's why we do what we do. Now, I'm trying not to answer questions because it, that's what takes up whole sessions. But why are people waiting for healing? Um, isn't it already done? It absolutely is done in the spirit. But you have to get it. it. It's just like salvation. Salvation is done because he died on the cross. But you have to receive it. Right? Now, I said that in one place in Saskatchewan. And I got an email. And I said, you need to receive your healing. And the person emailed. That was the same person that called me a heretic. But... It said you need to receive, and, and the, this particular person said you do not receive your healing, and I was like, hmm. So it kind of weighed in the back of my mind or whatever, and this was six, eight months ago, something like that. And just the other morning, I woke up just before we came here. I was, we were still in Canada. I came here, and and that hit me. What what this person said: you do not receive your healing. And then God said, yeah, but didn't Jesus say? receive your eyesight. And I was like, yeah, he did. So jump up out of bed, go through scripture, and it says in there, what do you want me to do for you? I want my eyesight. He said, receive your eyesight. So if Jesus said it, good enough for me. You receive your healing. Just like you receive salvation. If salvation, God's will is that none should perish. Okay? So his will is that you receive, everybody receives salvation, but you receive it. You receive forgiveness, same way you receive healing. Otherwise, we'd all walk around healed, we'd all walk around saved. No, you need to, it, it's, it's, faith is, I hate this word activate, but faith is what activates it. It's your faith in that. See, it's, it's like it says in Acts chapter 3, um, when they went up and they healed the, the lame man at the gate, beautiful, all that kind of stuff, he said it was... He said, why are you looking at us as though we did it through our own holiness? He said, it was that name and faith in that name that has made this man well. It's faith in that name. So you have to have faith in the fact that you're whole and you're healed. And the devil will absolutely fight you tooth and nail on it. He doesn't want you whole and healed. Because if you're not whole and healed, then you're really a trophy for him and not a trophy for God. See, God doesn't get glory out of your sickness. He gets glory out of your healing. The devil gets glory if you will, out of your sickness, your torment. He feeds off depression. He feeds off fear. He feeds off this stuff. And see, demons, you guys asked. This is why this, I'm trying. De demons, they need rest. And they find rest in a human soul. Demons can't attack your spirit, okay, if you're a Christian. They go after your soul. So this is why the Bible says if you go for somebody and you set them free and they go out into the dry places and they're cruising around looking for a place to rest, they return to their home. That's what the Word of God says, home. He calls you a home, okay, because he set up shop in you. So he comes to your home and he finds it clean and swept but not occupied. What does that mean? You're not filled with the truth of the Word of God. Then he goes out and gets seven of his buddies and makes that place worse than it was in the first place. So this is why discipleship, life teams, things like that, are so vitally important. Okay, are you familiar with life teams? Okay. So life teams are an integral part of John G. Lake Ministries. Curry had the vision for this many years ago, and it's really, really come into fruition now. There's life teams being started up all over the world. There was not a church, a Christian church, for the first about 313 years of Christianity. For th over 300 years, there was not a church building. They met in homes. 
12 or 13, at least 12 or 13 references in Scripture to they met in homes. They went to this particular home. Home, 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 home. Even said Jesus went into their home. Paul went into their home. These people went into homes because that's where real growth happens. It's, it's harder to get real growth in an environment of a church. And as, as, the, as the church grows in size, it gets a little bit harder because some people feel disconnected. I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's, it's difficult that when somebody's preaching, if you all had a question in here, we'd never get anything done, right? But if you're in a life team setting in your home, in somebody's home, then, and it doesn't have, you can, help, you can hold it in a church too, but it's a small group of people who come and study the Word of God together. They watch Curry's videos, they discuss it, um, and we're always looking for a life team leader in training. So if you guys were coming to, to our life team, I would be looking for you guys to, to take on your own life team or something of that nature. Uh, now, usually leaders will start to rise to the top and you say, okay, you're going to be our next life team leader. And we're always looking to raise people up to take on and multiply and start another life team in their home. So if you had homes here in this town, city, whatever you call it, and you had five or six of them, now you've got five or six little church plants everywhere where you're bringing people in. Now you're attacking your neighbor. So if I, it's too small to show you, but we just made a bunch of cards up in Canada that say you don't have to suffer from anxiety, fear, depression, guilt, shame, any of that kind of stuff. Let us help you. And then they come into that life team when we minister to them. Then we're dropping those off to every home, to bars, to you know wherever people are, which is everywhere. We're taking those in so they can come in. And people may not come to a church because they may have been hurt by a church. They may be hurt by leadership. There is scarcely a Christian that hasn't been hurt by leadership in some way, shape, or form. Okay, But that's because we've put trust in our leaders. The Bible says put trust in no man. See, when you put your trust in God, nobody can hurt you. Right? So, And we've been hurt by leadership, but it doesn't hurt. Because I take no offense. Like Curry said yesterday, you don't live by offense. So the life teams are when people come in, and normally we do a bit of a life team presentation, but this is a little different one. But you have these people come in, you can have a host of it, and then you can have a facilitator of it. It doesn't have to be the same thing. You could host one in your home. If you have a big enough home, let's say, and there's a group of 10 people that want to come out, and you don't really want to facilitate it because you're not comfortable in that or you don't know the word enough yet or something like that, but then there's somebody that does that doesn't have a big enough home, so you can have a host and a facilitator. And then someone could come in, you watch the videos, you talk about it, and that's where real spiritual growth happens. Sometimes it's very difficult to feel like family in a home or in a church. You know, we went to church for years, and you're just like family. Really? That's why you never call me? I mean, it's not so bad when some, when some of your family doesn't call you. I'm just saying. You know, we, we, would, we would miss going to church, and then we would go to church, and they would say, ah, oh, the place isn't the same without you. We've missed you so much. I've been gone for 10 months. My phone hasn't rang once. I'm not a country music fan at all, but I know there's a song that says, since my phone ain't ringing, I assume it still ain't you or something of that nature. S- same sort of thing. Oh, it's so good to have you here. We've missed you. The place is not the same without you, liar. You just, you just, you just trying to make me feel good, you know. And that's not true. So, but we lose that sometimes. Now, that's not the same for all churches at all. We belong to some churches that you know felt very good and, and you know good family feel to it. But in a life team setting, there's a lot of growth that can take place because you role play. Some people are not able to go out on the on the streets and and you know pray for people because they're afraid. It's not necessarily natural to do that. And I'm not afraid to preach the gospel, but I didn't want to bother people. So that was the hardest part for me, to walk up to somebody and say, excuse me, sir, I see you walking with a limp. How can I help you? You know, and it's just like, you're weird. You know, and that's the point. You have to get past the, the point of this may not work or, you know, get past that part of it. But we do that in life teams. So we'll take somebody and they'll come in and we'll say, okay, we're going to do a little bit of role playing. And then we say, hey, you know, I walk with a limp or something, and you say, hey, sir, can I help you? And I say, no, get away from me. What are you doing? And then teach you how to handle that situation. Or sure, you, you can do that, sure. And then you, how are you feeling now? Check what you couldn't do before, like Curry said last night. So we help with this, these different scenarios. Why? To train people for the work of the ministry. That's the, that's the job of the five-fold ministry is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Not, hey, guys, here we are. Watch us do this, and you get to do nothing. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. You're a Christian. You got the heaven living in you, but yet just sit there and do nothing? Sounds like a really good time. 
See, most churches are training people to, to sit, not go. We never train people to be chair warmers or pew warmers. We train them to go. That's what we need to do. This ministry is a go ministry. So that's what Life Teams do. Um, and we can, you can find more information on that at startlifeteams.com. Okay? And get more information on the DHT and all that kind of stuff is all, all on there. Uh, if you need to know about Life Teams in your area and stuff, you can talk to this handsome fellow over here. He can, he can help you. I wasn't talking to you. He, uh, <laughs> he's my brother. I used to like Yeah. I thought, and I thought you loved me. Yeah. Man, I've, I gotta go now, guys. I gotta no. I don't feel rejected. I really don't. Um, but he, but he can help you. We can get you hooked up in that. It's, 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 it's a good thing to to grow, and this is a good place to grow. It's safe, um, and people actually do care about you because it's a, it's a close knit family, right? So, anyway, I have two more questions here, and they're staying here for now. Section fifteen, one thirty one. Attempt to drink this water without spilling them because they fill these things right up. Not, not bad, eh? Did all right. So this is one area. Now I'm not sure if what your understanding is about the anointing. Most of the time, it's it's for for most Christians, um, it's it's a very whimsical thought. It's very well, it's wrong, and they don't know. They don't know the truth of the anointing. They don't know what anointing is. And Curry touched on it yesterday, but we're going to go through it in the manual. So section 15, Isaiah 10, 27 says, And it shall come to pass that in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So what is he talking about? Being yoked with the devil. Because if you're not a Christian, you either have God the Father or the devil, the father. That's, that is it. There's no in between those two things. Okay? And like Curry said yesterday, if you're not moving forward, you're backslidden. If you're not living out the knowledge that you have in you, you're backslidden. See, people think that if you, you're living in sin, that then you're backslidden. No, if you're not making forward progress, you're backslidden. To, a certain, to whatever degree. If you're not making progress even this much, you are backslidden. So this here is talking, it's saying that you'll be destroyed because of the, the, the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So you belong to the devil and you're yoked with the devil. You're yoked with the world, right? You know what a yoke is, right? The oxen thing and the yoke, okay? When the anointing comes upon you, that yoke is broken and Jesus said, take my yoke. My yoke is light, it's, it's burdensome, right? So you get yoked with him. So now you're yoked with him. You're one with him, not one with the world, not one with the devil. And that anointing is not power. It is not something that comes on you in a church service and you start shaking and get the goosey bumps and the hair stands. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. See, a lot of people teach, well, I can't, I can't get you healed because the anointing's not on me. Or we hear it all the time, well, he's an anointed woman, or she's an anointed woman of God, or he's an anointed man of God, and he's got an anointing for this, and she's got an anointing for that. That is not true. Absolutely not true. There's nowhere in Scripture you're going to find that. So then you have people that say, oh, I'm anointed to, you know, heal cancer or something like that. Okay, well, then I can't heal it because I'm not anointed for that. But you have the anointed one living in you, so you're anointed for everything because the anointing has to do with position, not power. So what this is talking about here is when you move from this position, this yoke, to this yoke, what has changed? Your position. Now you're with Christ. So you're yoked with him, and he's the anointed one who lives in you. Just like when somebody gets um, knighted, they come in, like Elton John, let's say. He, he, he comes in as Elton John. He gets knighted, and now he's appointed Sir Elton John. Is he still the same person? Sure he is, but his position changed. It's exactly the same thing. Your position changed from here to here. Now, we're going to go on. I'm going to go down to the next one, the second one down, or third one from the bottom. Exodus 28, 41. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and he shall anoint them and consecrate them. What does consecrate mean? Separate. Okay? And sanctify them. Same thing. Consecration and sanctification basically mean the same thing. Sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. What is that for? Does it say anything about power? What's the priest's office? A position. So he was, they were sanctified and consecrated and anointed for a position. Okay? Now, you have a spiritual anointing and you have a physical anointing. So this is going to kind of cover off both. But so far, no mention of power. 
Next one down, 29.7. Then shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. What is that? A physical anointing. Okay? It's physical. Same sort of thing as, you know, James chapter 5. It says that, you, you know, if there's any uh, afflicted among you, pray. If there's any Mary saying and all that. If there's any sick among you, call the elders. And they'll come and they'll anoint you with oil and they'll pray the prayer of faith and you shall be saved. And if you've committed sin, it shall be forgiven you. The anointing oil, see, people think, oh, I have to have anointing oil in order to get you saved. No, that is, all that is, is, is symbolic of separating and consecrating you. It's symbolic. It has no spiritual powers. So I don't care what you've bought on the internet or on the TV. It has no spiritual powers. You don't need to walk around with a bottle of oil in your pocket, you know, and you go pray for somebody at Walmart, and you're like, just sex her. What are you putting on me? What are you doing to me? You know, you don't need to do that. You are anointed. You have the anointed one living in you. But we, 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 it's easy to say stuff about the anointing because, again, it removes responsibility from us. And then, again, we, we end up exalting people in the fivefold ministry, and then we, they fall and we point fingers at them because we've created this, this enormous amount of pressure on them to perform. And that's what we have. We have commu- uh, um, consumerism Christianity where I'm coming in here and I'm paying you for a certain service or I'm paying you for a certain performance and judged on your performance will determine how much money I'm going to throw in the hat. We've created consumerism Christianity. It's not about that. Okay? So, uh, next one, 29, 35 through 37. And thus saith thou do unto Aaron and to his sons according to all things which I have commanded thee, seven days shall you consecrate them. And thou shalt offer every day a bullock and, uh, for sin offering for the atonement, and thou shalt cleanse the altar which thou hast made an, uh, atonement for it. So now we're talking about a physical thing, an altar. Okay? But when it talks about this, it's still talking about a, a physical anointing. They physically were going to anoint this thing. It wasn't some weird power spiritual thing. And thou shalt anoint it and sanctify it. Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. Are we not the temple of God? You see that last line there? Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. Now the, the altar is not going to become unholy or defiled. So why do we automatically think that we're going to become undef- or defiled when something unholy touches us? No, what I have is going to get on you. Not what you have is going to get on me. And this is why, back, back to the story of Mexico, I thought where people didn't want to go because they were afraid that you know, something was going to jump on them or leap on them or something of that nature. And like Curry said yesterday, if you've got the power to cast it out, it don't want on you. It's afraid of you. But we're afraid of it. Usually because we've watched too many ghosty, scary movies. <laughs> Usually, you know, like, you ever notice how many ridiculously satanic movies are coming out? And how they're trying to get your kids, you know, through, through Disney movies and, I mean, seemingly harmless, harmless stuff. It's witchcraft and they're coming after your kids. And, and we let it into our homes by saying, hey, here's YouTube, watch it for eight hours while I do whatever I want to do. I'm not saying tablets, phones, things like that aren't, aren't necessary. Of course, that's the way we communicate. But if we use them as our babysitter and we let them watch whatever they want, and then we can't give them trouble because they're turning out different than we thought they did while well, YouTube is their babysitter or the Internet's their babysitter or something of that nature. You're responsible for how your kids get raised. You're responsible for your, your kids' friends, period. My son's 30 years old, and he may be watching, and he has this one friend who won't be watching, so I can say this, who's, who's been a little not friendly. And I just said, why are, you, why are you wasting your time? I'm still trying to instill that into my son. He's 30 years old. Yes. It never, you never stop being a parent. I still sometimes treat my kids like they're five years old. Anyway, we got to get back into this. So Exodus 30, 30. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. So again, position, not power. Exodus 40, verse 9. And thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is therein and shalt hallow it and all the vessels thereof and it shall be holy. Okay? So anoint the tabernacle. So again, we're talking about a physical anointing. So you can't anoint people. Same with water baptism. 
See, some people teach that water baptism is uh, you have to be water baptized to be saved. If that is true, then Jesus lied to the man on the cross next to him. Because they had no chance to be water baptized. Right? He said, hey, listen. The other guy was kind of beacon off a little bit. And this guy said, listen, th- this man doesn't deserve this. We deserve this for what we've done. But this man's done nothing wrong. And then he looks at Jesus and said, hey, listen, would you, when you go to Paradise Day, would you remember me? And Jesus did, oh, man, if, if you could only get water baptized. <laughs> Anybody got any water? What did he say? I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in Paradise. Because he believed that he was the Messiah. He didn't say the, he didn't say the prayer. He didn't say the sinner's prayer. It's because it's not scriptural. We've relegated that. As long as you say the sinner's prayer, pet peeve. I always try not to say this, but I'm going to say it. Pet peeve of mine. Whatever church you go to, if they do it, that's cool. I don't go there. Okay? We're going to give an altar call. Is anybody here? This is, I'm not asking you guys this. I'm being fictitious right now. Eh? Yeah. If, if anybody here has ex- accepted and made Jesus Christ the Lord of their life, you can do that now. So everybody close their eyes, bow their heads right now. Everybody, every eye closed. Every eye closed. We don't want anybody looking. Now, if you haven't accepted Jesus, quickly slip up that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. We're beginning their life in Christ with shame. Come on. You realize that when people, got, when people got saved, there was Roman guards standing there. And they went into that water and they said, what is your name? And when they came out of the water, they sent people to their house and took everything that they had. Christianity cost them everything when they came up out of that river. And now we've relegated it to, oh, now you're in the kingdom of heaven. Go live how you want. You're saved. How many did we get saved this week, pastor? 30. God bless you. We got 30 saved this week. Oh, that church is doing a lot of stuff. Let's give them some more money. That's what it boils down to. I think it was John Wesley. Somebody asked him one time and said, hey, listen, how many people did you get converted? He said, I don't know. Give me six months. We'll see how many people are actually converted. Because just because you said a prayer doesn't mean you've been converted. Life and how you change makes you converted. Your life dictates if you're a Christian, not the words that come out of your mouth. But we've, we've done that so we can give... Good numbers to the people that support us. It's a lie. If I offered a million dollars cash and I put it up on the stage right now, and I said, hey, listen, there's a million bucks cash for anybody who wants it. You gotta run me over. Is there any, I mean, unless you thought I was joking, if you knew 100% that I was serious and there was a million beans up here for you to take, most of you, unless you already got a bunch of millions in the bank, would run up here and do what you needed to do to get that million dollars. But you offer salvation for all of eternity and the kingdom of God to move into you. The God of the universe that created everything to move into you, to change your life. And as every eye closed, every head bowed, quickly slip up your hand. Come on. Now, if you want your life changed, get up here, get on your knees. and God will change your life. How much do you want it? How much does it mean to you? And we, we end up mocking. It's a mockery. Now, I'm not saying if you've done it that way that you're not saved. I'm not saying that at all. But we can't just relegate it to that in a church setting and say that a whole bunch of people are saved. Most Christians who go to church are not even saved. They go out of tradition, and they go because they said a prayer. They go because they're a convicted sinner, and they go in there, they get their feel-good story for the week, they bail out, and they live like hell during the week, and they try to be a Christian on Sunday morning. And most people while you're in there can't wait because the football game's on or the hockey game's on or, you know, mama's making something good for lunch or whatever the case may be. Most of the time they're not even there. So why even go? Because you look good if you go to church. If you don't go to church, you look bad. Apparently you're a good church, you're a good church member or you're a good Christian if you go to church and God's got these gold stars up in heaven for good attendance. It's not true. But it's true. It's absolutely true. Why? Because I've been there. Again, you can't take it from me because I've been there. If I hadn't been there, I was there, bought the t-shirt, you know, did all that kind of stuff because I was there. Gold star attendance. 
Did you know all the way through grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, all that, I never missed a day of school? What's wrong with me? I think I broke my arm in school, and I never missed. I would go to school. I would, if I was sick, I would be dragging myself into school. I never missed school. They shut down school for snow, really. Yeah, yeah. They, they, once in a while, they'll shut down snow uh, school in Canada, but we have to, we we have to get a boatload. But if yeah, if you get a, this much snow here or something, you guys are done for a week, eh? <laughs> Yeah, it's even in parts of Canada, like out in Vancouver, if they get an inch of snow, um, I mean, it's, it's mad chaos. Um, sometimes we can get, you know, three feet of snow or something in a day, you know. It's not very often, but we can. So get back into this. What we're trying to do is not make church about games. We're trying to make church about truth. I love church. When I first got saved, I wanted to build a second story on the church that we were going to because I never wanted to leave. You know, we, we went into church, uh, that's a long story I'm not going to tell, but we went into church and I felt like I went home because I went in there and I, I just, I, I felt at home because God had this call on my life and I just had to wait this long time to fulfill it, like I told you guys. So I'm, I'm for church, I'm not against church, I love corporate worship, I love coming together, preaching, getting testimonies, talking about God's word, learning something, do all that kind of stuff. I had to leave church because I wasn't learning anything. And if you stay in a church that's not preaching the truth of the Word of God, you're unlearning your mind. You're, un, you're unrenewing it. You're un, unlearning the truth that's, that's being put in there. Well, you know, God just has me in this church to make you backslide? No, I don't think so. Get into a church that preaches the Bible. Get into a church that preaches the Word of God. It's not about numbers. It's about your spiritual growth. Amen. And again, no pastor is responsible for your spiritual growth. You are responsible for your spiritual growth. But he or she is responsible for what they're teaching. What is the right way to lead someone to Christ? They absolutely can say, Father, forgive me, absolutely. But we can't relegate it to that. So if you, if you I'm using you for example because you're sitting right in front of me. If I come to you and I minister the gospel and I say, does that sound right to you? And you say, yes, it does. I say, would you like to make Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes, I would. Okay, follow me, because you don't know what you're doing, so follow me. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, Father, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I know you died on the cross for me. I believe it. In Jesus' name, I give my life to you. End of story. So that, that can happen. That's just not in the Bible, because we've, we've tried to make, you that, make that a formulated prayer. Now what happens is you and I now get to walk together. If I don't live in your city or something and meet you on the streets, now you and him get to walk together. Or whoever, you know what I mean? We try to get you hooked up with somebody. That's why we have life teams. So we go out on the streets. Now you can go to your life team or your life team or your life team and we get people hooked in together and then they start to learn the truth. It's discipleship. It's not just say a prayer and you're good. That is not true. You don't find that in scripture. What you find is discipleship. And discipleship isn't just, hey, listen, follow a bunch of you know, meetings and things like that. Uh, discipleship is me reproducing myself in you, right? Because Jesus reproduced himself in us. So we become, this was spoken over Curry years ago, that we become, that J.J. Lamb will be a ministry of reproducers who reproduce reproducers who reproduce reproducers. You get it? You follow that through. So what is this? Reprodu reproducing. What did, you, what did God say? Go forth and Multiply. That's not talking about having 15 babies. Multiply. Multiply my image. Multiply my nature. Go forth and multiply. And, and teach people. That's what we're supposed to do. Teach people. Teach the nations. So how you get it done is you take them, you get them saved, and if you just let it be at a prayer and there's no spiritual growth, they're not going to pursue it. It's discipleship. You must disciple People. And what does that mean? Reproducing yourself in them. Follow me as I follow Christ. But most people, do you know I saw a poll the other day? Out of 100%, 50% of churchgoers, not people in the world, churchgoers, have no idea what the Great Commission is. 6% had kind of a vague idea. And a few other percent, but most of them had no, there was about 22% out of 100 that actually knew what the Great Commission is. And I'm not going to take that poll here because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But we got to win a lost generation. 
That's why the world isn't the way it is, because we don't know what the Great Commission is. If you don't know what the Great Commission is, you cannot live the Great Commission. The Great Commission is going out and preaching the gospel, saving the sick, healing, all that kind of stuff, and, and making disciples. Now, you, you can't truly make a disciple because it's a choice of, of their own personal thing, whether they're going to be a disciple or not, right? But we can give them the option of discipleship. So that's how you get them. That's how you convert them. That's how you win them. You take them, you train them, and you spend time with them. But that costs you. It costs you your home. It costs you your time. It costs you. And we're busy, so, so busy doing things that don't even matter. We don't have time for discipleship. So we put it all on the pastor. Let him do it. He's not busy. Just let him do it. That's what happens, is it not? Discipleship. That's how we win this thing, is discipleship. Okay? So that's how you do it. Now, again, I'm not saying that if you said, Jesus, forgive me, come into my life, you're, oh my gosh, I'm not saved. No, I'm not saying that. Your actions dictate whether you're saved. It doesn't matter what you say, it's how you live. It's how you live that determines how, if, if you're saved or not saved. Not by what you say. Because you can give, the Bible clearly says that they, can, they confess with their mouth. They, they, they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So you can come into church. Now we're getting a whole topic of being in vain. Anyway, you know, you can, ver, you can worship in vain. When you come into church every weekend and you worship, it can be all for nothing. Your service in church can be in vain because you're doing it for man. You can, the Bible says that a time will come where you, you will worship God in spirit and truth. So if you're not worshiping in spirit and truth, you're worshiping out of your soul. You don't determine the worship God accepts. He determines the worship that he will accept. So when we come in and we're just raising our hands, but we're thinking of lunch, you're not worshiping. You're going through the motions. So you got to worship God in spirit, soul, and body. But most people just worship in body because their motions are going. Hands are going, whatever, they're singing away, blah, blah, blah. And it ends there. Some people might be worshiping up out of the soul, but most people aren't worshiping out of the spirit. Do you see the difference? And, and so many times, do, do, we won't get into it now, but do a search on in vain. Go through the Bible and look up in vain. Even Paul said, hey, listen, I'm, I'm worried. I'm concerned for you guys that my labor has been in vain or that Christ died in vain. So you can do things. Your Christian walk can be in vain. This is a serious deal. This is, this is no joke. You know, it's a big, it's a big deal to, to understand who you really are in Christ and what he paid. If he gave his life for us, then how can our Christianity be so wish-washy? It was serious enough to cost him his life, and we just treat it as a Sunday event. Pastor, you better not go over. I got the roast on. <laughs> I talked to him one time afterwards. He's like, yeah, it was over an hour today and stuff. But that's, but you understand? And I'm not saying it's, we, we need to walk around on eggshells. No, we need to walk around with, with devotion. Now, I, I really do have to get back into this, but we, I really have to get into this, but we're not going to. <laughs> we're used to it. I know. I was, as I say, I kind of learned that from Curry, too. But we were at a Christian bookstore, which are kind of not a thing in Canada anymore, so I was really surprised we found a, a Christian bookstore. And we go in there, and then there's all these new preachers, and I'm not against new preachers. Okay, I'm against New Age preachers with a form of Christianity. And it's like, think yourself this way, think yourself this way, think yourself this way, think, 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 think. And I get that to a point because the Bible tells us to renew our mind. I get it, okay? But if you could think your way into everything, then you wouldn't need Christ. Okay? Now, you renew your mind to the Word of God, not renew your mind to humanism. Okay? Now, all these preachers think this, think this, and it's, like I said to Curry, I message them, and it's a perverted twisting of mind renewal. The devil tries to pervert everything that God does. He can't really, he can't duplicate it, but he can try to counterfeit it and pervert it, okay? So all this stuff, and I'm looking at it, and uh, I just, oh my gosh, this is terrible. So I go around the corner, and I get into a section called History Slash Science. And this is where they had John Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, um, T.L. Osborne, all these awesome pioneers and generals of God that we look at their lives and say this is amazing under science and history it was like this big this tiny little two two tiny little shelves that was it and they had you know four or five books in total because they had the other books stacked up and I was looking at it 
And right at that moment, God said to me, most Christians have made me a thought, not a devotion. So to most Christians, God has a thought, not a devotion. Because they think, you know, you know God's this thing that I'm going to add into my life. He's not a supplement. You know, a supplement is something you add to you, like taking a vitamin to add some things to you. He's not a vitamin. He's not a supplement. He's a replacement for what the devil had for you. And this whole thing, I, it just, it, stu- it stuck me. That word devotion has been, I looked it up, and a devotion is something that you give yourself to, not just a thought. And for most Christians, he's just a thought, oh, Sunday, better get to church. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then they leave. And he's, he's, he's not even a thought for that rest of that week, but he's a thought on Sunday. Or a thought when you get in trouble. But he's not a devotion. A devotion means you're wholly devoted to it. Every ounce of your being is devoted to it. Because every ounce of his being was devoted to you. Every ounce of who he is, he devoted himself to you. Everything that Jesus did, he did not do for himself, he did for you. That's amazing to me. And we're really going to try to finish this up in five minutes, which isn't going to happen. Okay. Uh, I don't even remember where we were. Uh, I think Exodus 49. And thou shalt take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle. Yeah, we were. It shall be holy. Exodus 14, 11. Or, sorry, 40, 11. And thou shalt anoint the laver with his, and his foot and sanctify it. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him so that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Again, position not power. First Samuel 15, um, you can see it says, Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. What was David anointed into? King. Position. Okay? Now, you can go through all this, um, Samuel, and we're not going to go through it all because we just don't have time for it. But, we're going to try to get to Samson. So we all, we're all familiar with the story of Samson, correct? He was a bit daft, right? He did some silly stuff, that guy, you know? But yet God still used him. Isn't that amazing? He went into brothels and prostitution, all this stuff, and God still used him. Delilah wasn't his wife. Look what was happening. And he... he, he you have this woman who's, who's saying, give me your secrets. And he tells, well, you lied to me. How come your heart's not with me? Well, you're trying to destroy me. That would be my first thing. But he tells it and he tells it and he tells it. And finally, he says, this is what the truth is. And you know the whole story. He chopped off his hair, all that kind of stuff. Isn't it amazing, though, that every time he said, this is how I lose my power, somebody showed up with that thing. That might have been a first clue that you know she's trying to she's trying to do you in here, right? So this whole thing happens, the hair gets chopped off, all that kind of stuff. You can read it, we're not gonna read it because that's all the judge is 16 here. And what happens? She chops it off. And then she says, Hey, the Philistines are here, just like she did. And he said, I'll get up, I'll shake myself like I've done in times past. And what did he do? He would wipe them out and kill people with a job. I mean, he did all that stuff, right? In, in extraordinary strength. See, we think he would look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but Curry figures he would look like Woody, Al- Woody, Al- uh, Woody Allen. Because people said, where did this guy get this strength from? So if he looked like Arnold, people would not say that's where he got his strength from. But if he's a little tiny pipsqueak, then you would wonder that you knew it was a spiritual strength. So I agree with him. I don't think that he would have been this monster of a man. I think he would have been this little guy because God gets more glory, you know, from a five foot tall, I don't know how tall he was, but a guy that can, you know, rip gates off and swing them around and kill people, right? But he said, I'll get up and I'll shake myself. And he got up, um, where is it in here? Um, I don't know where it is on here. Whereabouts it is in 16... Verse 20, on page 135. And she said, The Philistines are upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. So this is what he did. He would go out and he would shake himself. Okay, 
And he, it says, and he wished not or did not know the Lord had departed from him. Which means what? The anointing is not a feeling. Because he would have known I, when he woke, I feel different. I don't feel anointed. And you hear this all the time in church. Well, I just don't feel the anointing. It's not about a feeling. It's about position. Now we'll look at it when we come back and we'll finish up and then we'll let you go for dinner and then we'll do the evening sessions tonight. But we're going to finish up with these two verses right here. First John 2.20, Curry had kind of already brought them up, but First John 2.20 says, but you have an unction, okay? And the word unction means anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. See, husbands, we are right. We do know all things. Well, I said, well you think you know it all? Apparently. <laughs> My wife doesn't say that to me. First John 2.27, but the anointing which you have received of, of him abides in you. To stay, it means it's taken up residence. It lives in you. The anointing which you have received of him that abides in you. Well, who abides in you? Jesus. And he is the anointed one. So you're never not anointed. The only time you're not anointed is if, you're not, if you don't have Christ in you. If you're a Christian, you're a born-again believer, you are absolutely anointed. And your anointing doesn't grow it doesn't leave, it doesn't change, it isn't whimsical, none of that stuff. So if you hear people teach, well, you know, oh God, I just, I just I feel the anointing. It's not true. It could possibly be true because you're feeling the presence of God in you. You're feeling the anointed one in you. But as soon as you begin to start serving a feeling, when that feeling isn't there, then all of a sudden you're not saved. You have... God woke me up in Mexico one time and said, don't have faith in faith, have faith in the knowledge of faith. I said, what? And it took me two or three weeks to break that down before I preached it. I had to unwrap it and repackage it, unwrap it, repackage it, stretch it out. I mean, do everything you could to get it right. But don't have faith in faith. What's having faith in faith? Don't have faith in your faith. That's humanism. Have faith in the knowledge of faith. What's the knowledge of faith? That I am anointed. That I am saved. I'm whole. I'm healed. I'm sa I can have my knowledge in that. The Bible always says to grow in the knowledge of God, right? So I have knowledge of faith, not a feeling, not having faith in my faith. And so many people have to, they try to have faith in faith. It's not hard to have a mustard seed. And like I said the other day, everything is given to you in seed form. Everything, including the kingdom of God, is given to you. Faith is given to you. The Bible says that you've been given the measure of faith. Well, what's, the, what's the, the measure of faith? The Bible never really says, but, it's, but it talks about a mustard seed. And you've been given the measure. And this is here, that this anointing that you've received abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is true and is no lie, and it, have, even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. So we're talking about Christ. So Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is the anointing because the yoke has been broken. You've been moved over here. You're yoked with him. The anointings come upon you and now the Holy Spirit can come upon you which we'll talk about before we end the night, okay? Or end this afternoon. The anointing has nothing to do with power, period. I don't care how people slice it, dice it, preach it, make it sound good, anything like that. It is not true. It has to do with position. So anybody says, well, you know what, you're not anointed, say that's not true because of 1 John 2.20 and 1 John 2.27. I have an anointing that abides. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to take a break and we'll come back.